So let's finalize uh, this example. Uh, and uh, I was asked about this d value of 18, um, where that came from, and th this is the measured value, the new information. It's described in the <coughs> in the problem in uh, uh, in page uh, 89 that you get a new uh, observed demand for the first quarter of 1993, which is the no, the new data of 18, and we want to update the values of the series, the values of the gradient, and also the value of the seasonal factor for the first quarter. Ideally, every time you make a new uh, update of a seasonal factor, you should also update the others to, to get uh, to get them norm to be exactly equal to, to 4 when you sum them together. So, okay, we remember the formulas which was presented uh, uh, last uh, uh, lesson and uh, we now first start with updating the series. So, we have uh, we are now looking for the value of S1. We remember that the old value was 48.34. So the new value will be the smoothing constant for the series, which is alpha. And according to the problem text, alpha should be the alpha value used should be 0 0.2. This is now the importance of the new value according to uh, the, uh, the uh, according to the new measured demand of 18. So alpha 0 0.2 multiplied by the demand. Demand is 18, but you need to adjust by the seasonal factor for that particular season, which is 0 0.33. Dividing 18 by 0 0.33, you will get the value for this, uh, uh, for this particular season and uh, how, how much the 18 is according to, uh, by dividing by, by the seasonal factor, you will get the, the de-seasonalized value for, for the series, for the new measured value. But we also need to add 1 minus alpha, which now is 0 0.8, to the previous forecast without the seasonalizing, and the previous forecast is the sum of the previous series and the previous gradient. 0 0.8 multiplied by 48, 34 plus 0 0.56, a total of 50.03. This now will be the new value of the series to be used in forecasting. The new value of the gradient, G1. Also here we have a smoothing constant, but this smoothing constant, beta, is given with another value. The smoothing constant doesn't need to have the same value. So the beta value, according to the problem text, will be 0 0.15. multiplied by the difference of the current value of the series and the previous value of the series. 50.03 minus 48.34. Increase of the series value from the last period to the current period. And again, adjust by multiplying 1 minus beta, which now will be 0 0.85, to the previous value of the gradient, which was 0 0.56. And this will end up to be 0 0.73. So here we can see that adjusting the series values, 50 all three, uh, and adjusting the gradient, 
it will be 0 0.73 so we have increased both the value of the series and the value of the gradient according to the new measured value 18 which was higher than the forecasted value according to our previous model and at last we also need to c1 to update c1 uh, the seasonal factor and it will now be the third uh, smooth and constant, the gamma value, and the gamma is said to be 0 0.1, multiplied by the new demand, 18, divided by the previous, no, divided by the new value of the series, 503. This tells how much in percentage the demand is according to the trend line, which is not <coughs> seasonalized. And plus 1 minus gamma, which is 0 0.9, multiplied by the previous value of the, C, uh, the seasonal factor, 0 0.33. And this will end up to a value of 0 0.333, if we include one more decimal here. So now we have new values. New value for the series, the gradient, and the seasonal factor. This, of course, will not be, uh, be used until next period, until next first season. This question? Wasn't this in, uh, 0 0.5 on the G1? What is 0 0.85? It, it's 1 minus beta, 1 minus 0 0.15. Similar to all the smoothing constant, you use the smoothing constant and multiply by the current value. And you will use 1 minus the smoothing constant. In this case, 1 minus 0 0.2. In this case, 1 minus 0 0.15. And 1 minus 0 0.1. This is the relative importance between the new value and the, the previous forecast. So now, we have all these values and we can make a forecast for next period and that's what we are asked for we want a forecast for the yeah we want a forecast for uh, the f uh, end of the first quarter of 93 for the remaining three quarters which means we can just remove this one because we will not use this new value until next year. So it's not relevant now. So we can use the space on the blackboard for making forecasts. Because we now, first, we want to make a forecast for the next period, which is period 2 in 1993. So we are in period 1. We want to make a forecast for period 1 plus tau. Gives us the formula S1 plus the tau, the number of periods, multiplied by G1, and multiplied by C of 1 plus tau. The seasonal factor for the same period we want to forecast. <coughs> so forecast from period 1 to period 2 S1 50 all 3 tau is now 1 so we have to add one time the gradient 0 0.73 50 all 3 plus 0 0.73 should be 50.76 multiplied by the seasonal factor for period 2 0 0.83 gives us a total of 42.13. Next forecast, still in period 1, but now we want to make a forecast for period number 3, third quarter in 1993. And the S value and the G value are the same, but now tau will be 2, we are making a forecast for two periods ahead, 
which means that we add 50 all three by 0 0.73 multiplied by 2 and adjust by the seasonal factor and this is a top season 1.67 so we adjust by that one and we get a total of 85.99 And similar for period number four, one, we are still in the same period. We, ha we have no more data, so we cannot update the S and the G values. We will use the same values. 50 all three plus three times, since we are forecasting three periods ahead, three times the gradient of 0 0.73, and multiplying the sum by 1.17, which is the current seasonal factor. A total of 61.10. So this is now the values of the forecasted values for the three remaining periods in 1993. When you used the parameter values you have found by first initializing this method and then updating with the current demand in period number one, which was 18. So this was uh, an example on Winter's method. I will, as usual, upload this uh, uh, well, uh, Word uh, file with, with these uh, uh, examples uh, on, on Fronter. And you should also study the example in the textbook regarding this uh, Winter's method. And as you know, this is a part, a central part of assignment number two because the whole problem number one concerns this Winters method for making a forecast when you have both a trend, in this case an increasing trend, but the trend can also be decreasing, go down, that's, uh, well, the, the principle is the same anyway, and you have seasonal differences. You know that in uh, some periods you will sell more than in other periods. Question? On the exam, yeah, your personal notes and the book, all, all printed and, uh, uh, and written notes. But you should uh, organize them, because usually there will be lots of work on an exam. So if you don't know where to find the information you are searching for, it's no time for looking in books and, and notes. But uh, you are allowed to bring them. How did you get uh, party to This one? Yes. Use the, the formula here. The S1 value is 50 all three. The tau value in this case is one because you're forecasting for one period ahead. <coughs> so tau one should be multiplied by the G value, 0 0.73. You add 50 all three by 0 0.73. And uh, you multiply by the seasonal factor, which is 0 0.83 in period number two. So this should be 5076 multiplied by 0 0.83 should be 4213. Yeah. Okay, before we continue to chapter three, I will say a few things about another forecasting method, because we have now seen examples on uh, uh, on the, this uh, stationary series, we have seen examples on uh, methods for trend-based series. We have seen examples on seasonal and trend-based series. But in real life, there are also other uh, types of uh, uh, well, other types of, of pattern, which is not always as easy to recognize. Well, seasons are quite uh, quite obvious uh, in some products sell more in one season than another season uh, but there could be other dependencies which is not very easy to find and this is actually not directly a part of the curriculum but uh, you should know about it you should know that there are more advanced methods than we actually learn about here and these are what is called the box Jenkins models. <coughs> it is quite complex and uh, well, <coughs> quite 
also, well, this, this is based on quite advanced statistics. You need a lot of data points, what they recommend here, at least 72 data points. And if you are talking about months, then you need at least six years of, of data. Uh, and you will try to exploit the structure of what they say here, the autocorrelation function of the time series for what they have called the lag k. So you can try to find some kind of correlation, which is not easy to recognize by just looking at, at the logic. Some products might have some correlation that they have a peak period every third month, for example. Could be of several reasons. It could be that well, the lifetime of the product is also some time which is uh, well quite easy to understand because some product might last for three months and then if you had a peak period, one uh, period, then three months later, the, well, all the customers might need to buy a new version of the product. This can happen. This is quite obvious to, uh, to, uh, to understand, but it could also be some correlation which is not very easy to, to understand by using traditional logic. But in more advanced types of, of forecasting, then they use uh, these types of models called the bo box Jenkins, which are able to identify more complex dependencies than trends and season, and also <coughs> able to identify such dependencies which you not cannot find directly by, by, by using traditional logics. These are sophisticated st statistical methods. They are not, as mentioned, directly a part of the curriculum, but you should know that these methods exist and also know that, that there are more advanced methods for, uh, for forecasting than you actually need, uh, learn in, in this course. I think I had some small data uh, uh, on, uh, well, I think I used one, one hour explaining the main principles of Box Jenkins a few years ago, so you might find a question about that in one of the old exam problems. Uh, as mentioned, not directly a part of the curriculum uh, today, but still you should know about that there are methods which are more complex and uh, more advanced that you learn in, in this course. That's all about forecasting. And now we can continue. And as you also have seen in uh, assignment number two, that uh, you have a problem here on aggregate planning. And we start looking at the theory of aggregate planning today. We need some background information. We need to know what is an aggregate unit. And when we know about aggregate units, we will learn how to use different strategies for uh, creating a production plan. And uh, these strategies, I will not be able to present them today, but I will next week start on going through the theory on chase and or in zero inventory uh, production plans or constant workforce. And also we will start looking at linear programming to, to try to identify the optimal solution, which usually will be somewhere in between the two extreme strategies here, one and two. <coughs> but let's now continue to chapter number three. And this is called uh, aggregate planning. And uh, here, the, well, the goal here to plan to uh, uh, to plan gross workforce level and set production plans according to a given uh, demand. And the demand might be found by using some of the forecasting methods that you have learned in chapter two. So now we can assume that we have a good forecasting method and we have a good plan for what is going to happen in the coming periods. For example, the next six months. We use the forecasting method and we have experience that this forecasting method is pretty good. So we assume that this will be the real demand and if we know our production company we want to set up production <coughs> plans to meet the demand found by some forecasting method or of course you should also include if you have um, 
if you have uh, current orders, for example, you will know some information of what is going to happen in the future. You have an order that is uh, um, ordering a certain number of, uh, uh, of items for, for a given period, and then you know about this order, and you need to make up a production plan and include known information in, in according to, um, to forecasting. But we also need to know what is the units we are going to use in the plans here. And the concept we should first talk about is what we call the aggregate unit of production. Aggregate units are units used for forecasting, uh, for, for um, making up a production plan, that we need a certain number of aggregate units. And this might be actual units. You know a certain number of your product, given from by, by forecasting or existing orders, and you know that you need exactly that number of units, or you assume that you need exactly this number of units in these particular periods. Uh, also, sometimes you have weight, that you need a certain given number of tons of steel, for example, if you are producing steel or any other uh, type of product, similar products. You can have volumes if you are producing liquids. You can have an aggregate units, which actually is time, worker hours. Could also be a, a unit to, to plan when you have more service-based uh, uh, product. Uh, you might use uh, dollars or any amount of currency of, of sales, but what we will soon see an example of, we can actually use a fictionous quantity, which is not a real product. It is an aggregate product. You put different aspects of different similar products, but still uh, different products together, and create an aggregate, uh, an aggregate unit, which we are using for forecasting. And these types of products are often used when you have quite similar products, they are well, they are very close to each other. They are different. They might be different types of, of a product which have many uh, many components common, but they, they will be uh, differentiated by different uh, components. So here. Let's yeah, talk about the overview of the pro problem. You suppose that we have a given number of demands for, for a given number of, uh, of periods, in this case t. And the problem is to determine the production and the workforce level. Of course, workforce and production will, uh, uh, they will, uh, can be seen, seen together because you might need a certain number of workers to be able to, to produce. Uh, they produce, uh, they have a well, given production capacity each, and to meet a production plan, you need also to determine how many workers do you need to be able to meet, uh, to meet uh, that production, what you, what you are in need for the coming periods. Still, you want to minimize the total cost over the T period planning horizon. That's uh, at least a, a part. Uh, um, partly a, a goal. You will always want to minimize cost, but there are also, of course, other aspects which is, uh, is relevant to consider when you are making a production plan. So, you have some issues mentioned here. Uh, smoothing is one issue. Refer to the cost and disruption that result from making changes from one period to next. Could be reasons that uh, even if um, you have a uh, you have analyzed and find out that uh, you're minimizing the cost. Will uh, will find um, that you should have much production in one period and uh, less production in, in another. Uh, but still, there might be reason to try to smooth and to try to have a more level production in different periods. This could also be cost effective, but not necessary because disruptions of uh, our production might have some other uh, well, other aspect, which is not uh, well, you, you do not do not want, and and want to have these aspects, and and you would like to smooth the production and produce more or less equal in in the different periods. 
Uh, you might have bottleneck planning, meeting peak demand because of capacity restrictions. Sometimes you will suddenly appear uh, a very high um, uh, interest for, for your product and uh, you might l need to, to plan for that so you have capacity for meeting that demand because of, of course you will earn money if you are able to sell more products. You do not, do not always know about these peak periods. But planning according to, to bottlenecks, you know where to put in resources uh, when these peak periods uh, appears. Uh, planning horizoning is, is another issue. Assume that you have a given planning horizon, T. But uh, what is the right value here? Uh, rolling horizon means that you are always updating the planning horizon. So when you are uh, going into a new period, you will include one more period in the planning horizon. Uh, or you can set up a fixed plan and then you need to update and set up a new fixed plan for a given number of periods later. Treatment of demand. Assume that the demand is known. Ignore uncertainty to focus on predictable and systematic variation in demand such as, uh, as seasonality. So, but you have already learned about methods how to include seasonality in, uh, in forecasting. So we have different costs we are talking about. One is the smoothing cost. Changing size of the workforce could be expensive. We will see example on these different strategies uh, uh, later. You will have some cost. Uh, it's always a cost of employing new people. Uh, they might need to, to give them some, well, learn them how to do their work and so on. Uh, there is a cost uh, of getting rid of people if you are uh, over um, uh, more people than you actually need. Uh, there are costs of changing production, number of units to produce. There are always some, some costs which will appear when you are, uh, you are uh, changing uh, production and, and workforce. Uh, there are costs involved in uh, holding or storing inventory. The primary component here will be what we call the in internal interest rate, which is defined as the opportunity cost of investment. You can invest your money in a high stock, lots of people on sto uh, stored on, on the stock, but if you don't invest the money there, you could put them in the bank and get some interest, or you can invest them in stocks or, or whatever else. You could use the money otherwise. So this is the primary component of the holding cost. What would you earn if you used the money on some other thing than actually storing inventory? Shortage cost is also a central element. Cost of the demand exceeding the stock of hand. Why should shortages be an issue if the demand is known? Well, that's the question. Uh, but of course, the demand is not always known. You, well, uh, we pretend in the model to know the demand, but uh, uh, there will always be some uncertainty in real life when you come out to the real life. So even if the models uh, are treating the demand as it is known, there will be uh, some uncertainty and you might uh, experience that you, you get short of product. You don't have enough to, to meet the, the demand. And there could be other costs, such as uh, payroll, overtime, subcontracting and so on. So there are always, in real life, lots of different costs. In these models, we will look mostly on the smoothing cost and the holding cost. Cost of changing size of the workforce, employing new or getting rid of people. Uh, and that will also affect the number of units uh, produced and the cost of storing inventory. So let's now talk about aggregate units. And we have already mentioned this could be actual units, it could be weight, it could be volume, it could be a value, or we can create aggregate units which is based on different or a combination of products. And then it's much easier to use an aggregate unit in forecasting. Uh, the example we will look at in, uh, in a short while is about washing machines, which have different types of washing machines. In this case, you have six models with a different model, yeah, different name here. 
uh, they are of different, uh, uh, well, you have some ad more advanced, which uses more time to produce. This is the number of production hours. So the simplest model will use 4.2 hours of production time. The most advanced model will use 5.8 hours of production time. They have a different price. The cheapest one, the simplest one, of course, and this one, more advanced, will have a, a higher price. And you have also a percentage of the sales. Most people will buy the simplest version and then you have a few less that will buy the more advanced versions here. But to make a forecast for each of these types, first of all, it will be time consuming and the accuracy will also be quite uh, low on each of the models. And the, the uncertainty will be much higher if you look at each model as one single product than if we try to combine them. Because you can have a quite accurate estimate of how many people will buy a washing machine in the next periods, but it's harder to find out how many people will buy this model and this model and this model. And since washing machines are quite, well, the products are quite similar, they, are, they have lots of, uh, of common components, but they are, uh, well, the difference are some more advanced components included in the more advanced uh, models. So the question is, how do we define an aggregate unit? Well, price is not necessarily proportional to the worker hours. We saw that in the previous table. Uh, yeah, could be different reason for that. And here we can try to define a method by looking at the percentage of the sales and the, the number of uh, worker hours for the different uh, different types of washing machines. Go back to this one. So, um, to create an aggregate unit in this case could be, well, we, we could count the actual units, but uh, of course they have different working hours, they have different price and they also, uh, well, different uh, uh, profit of, of selling them. It, you will have a more profit of selling a large or, or a more advanced type than on the small types, but of course the volume on the small, small types are much higher. So in total you might, uh, might have more, you earn money on, on the small than on the, on the more advanced uh, uh, machines. But here, instead of counting the actual units or looking at the sales volume or the price and so on, we will try to create an aggregate unit uh, to use in, uh, uh, in for the production plan. And one aggregate unit here can be to multiply the number of working hours here by the percentage sales. So, aggregate unit, you can have 0 0.32 multiplied by 4.2, which is the percentage of the sales multiplied by the number of working hours for that particular machine, plus 21% of the product or, or the, the model that uses 4.9 hours. Or, uh, and add again 5.1 multiplied by 17%. And similar for the three remaining uh, models, 14% multiplied by 5.2, 10%, and at last 6% multiplied by 5.8. 
this will be a total of 4.856 which now will be the working hours for one aggregate washing machine based on all these six models. 4.856 will be close to this one so a typical washing machine in this case will be the second cheapest machine. But still, we create an aggregate unit of one washing machine based on the difference on the working hours, which also will be the difference of cost for produ producing. If we assume that the components have more or less the same, uh, the, the same uh, value, then the working hours is what it's actually uh, deferring and uh, uh, well, it's, it's different in cost of the different machines, and you have a given percentage of the sales here. The percent, total percentage of the sales will always be one. So, this 4.856 is the number of working hours for one typical washing machine. And then, we have one aggregate unit formed by this formula here and we can make forecast for demand for aggregate units by taking the weighted average. So using this aggregate unit find in, in the for forecasting process using forecasting method based on aggregate units we can find out that okay 150 persons will probably buy a washing machine next period and then we can use the percentage to try to uh, to uh, find the number of, uh, uh, of uh, washing machines needed for each of the different models. And doing it this way, you will usually get a more uh, accurate and a more robust forecast uh, because uh, it is easier to make an overall forecast than to make different forecasts for each of the different models and to create, uh, uh, well, to use all the models in, in the, uh, uh, well, make models for each of the uh, washing machine types of, of washing machines here. It's much easier to find out or to, uh, to estimate how many will buy a washing machine and these percentages might change over time, might be more uh, people might need uh, more advanced washing machines, for example, but then it's easier to change the, the percentages. <coughs> and in such cases, you will usually have products which are quite similar. They are quite close to each other and use much, much of the same components. So next time, next week, I will, we will try to use such aggregate uh, units and uh, I'll continue on the washing machine example and we are given a forecasted demand for eight months of these aggregate units and we will try to use different strategies of creating production plan according to the given forecast for the given eight months. Okay, and we continue on this next week.